Good afternoon. My name is Nuno Martins and I'm a senior channel solutions architect for Red Hat South Africa. I'm based in Joburg and today um, I'm going to be going through some cool things on Ansible and uh, hopefully focusing around a use case as opposed to just discussing the tech. So we know that Ansible is pretty powerful um, and it can do pretty much anything you, you, know, you can do with a keyboard. So that's why I really wanted to focus on a use case specifically. So with a use case, I'm going to be using um, a KVM backend. So I'm going to be using and provisioning some servers. I'm going to be doing some configuration management on those servers. We also will need some kind of uh, centralized storage. So I'll be utilizing a cluster stack. We will also have a requirement to uh, trigger some kind of network automation. So we will have a virtual firewall in place and I'll be, you know, changing a rule or two to make sure that uh, traffic flows between two, two separate networks using Ansible. We will have um, a bit of a focus around uh, some kind of development workflow, which is uh, based around Git. So we'll have a, a, a Git server running and I'll be using a webhook to, to trigger jobs within my tower. Uh, and this will be um, pretty important to, to trigger the application itself. And lastly, we'll be having a bit of fun with a chat uh, chat bot, which uh, I will be using mainly just to get a status of systems. So these um, you know system updates can be driven by the bot um, and it just gives us a bit more insight. Okay, so <clears throat> what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to have a look at Tower and uh, ultimately what my use case is today is I want to try build a, um, a video on demand platform and automate as much as I can. So the key thing for, for this is obviously we need some kind of central storage, which I'll use Gluster for. And, um, you know, we're going to have different types of nodes. You're going to have a development node that's going to hopefully stream some video. Uh, which will stream off the cluster and we'll obviously need some kind of transcoding area so we'll need a transcoding node who's going to pick up some storage and pick up some files and then process those files so let's uh, dive in let's have a look at uh, ansible tower i'm going to log in as my infrastructure user so one of the benefits obviously with with tower is the fact that we have role role-based access so you can build um, your your templates you can build your um, you know, inventories, etc., and you can control all of this with this role-based access. You can control which teams can have access to what, and also what they can do. You know, can they use the the provided template or, or inventory, etc., or project, or can they edit it? Can they be admins? Can they just use them? Can they read them? All of this is controlled by Tower. So, <clears throat> if we look here, we can see I've got one inventory I'm using. I've got a couple of hosts on here, and I've got one project. So, if we look at my project. Uh, my project is connected to my Git repository and it's pulling all my files from there, all my um, playbooks, etc. that I'm going to be using. So let's have a look at our templates. So the templates itself, I've already built the templates. The templates, you know, link to underlying playbooks. Um, but the real cool feature is what we call the workflow template. So you can see we have individual templates, which effectively are individual plays or um, playbooks. And then we have our workflow template. And the reason why workflow templates are so um, impressive is the fact that you can actually use them in what we call a visualizer. So this workflow visualizer uh, ultimately allows us to build the logic. And um, this automation logic is basically like a bigger recipe to, to basically what, uh, you know, automate and get to what you want to get to. So if we have a look here, you can see now that it's, it's pretty blank and we're gonna build our workflow. So first, first things first, we're going to select um, our build my servers template. That's going to be my starting block. And then from there, we're going to have to, you know, diversify. I'm going to change a few things here. So I know this, we're going to add network to this system. So this is going to first build our development system, which we're going to ultimately use to stream video. Then we're going to have now a um, configuration to change the network configs on this. Um, but what we'll probably also want to do here is I want to start con uh, configuring my storage. So I do have a cluster um, environment already. So I'm just going to put that there. 
So what this is going to allow me to do is build a secondary volume or a volume specifically for uh, this use case for the streaming media. Um, so now we're going to have our starting point with the devs and now we're going to split them up so that we continue on this path to configure the network and get that machine up. And then on here, I'm actually going to provision my storage. Once I provision my storage, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to trigger another job and this will be to um, provision a transcoding uh, machine effectively. So this will come from a base uh, image, just like my development machine, except these have you know, ex additional packages. They've got things like FFmpeg for transcoding. They've got iNotify for, for watch folders. Um, so we're going to be using those um, if we carry on with the transcoding side of it. So we're going to deploy the image. Now we want to configure. Uh, we're going to configure it. And then lastly in this stream will be a, uh, an action to actually connect our storage. So that will be that one. And the reason why I do it there in my mind really is because at this point we should have any systems that we wanted to provision already up. So we won't have any issues with machines not being up and therefore not uh, accessing storage or not being mounted. So if we go back to the development machine that we want to set up, so that comes out, it's going to set that up. Um, and now we'll have to do the final changes there and bring that guy up. So effectively, that's what our very simple workflow looks like. When this gets triggered, it's going to go through the step of building and deploying the dev system, and then it will carry on that path to configure that dev system. And then on this alternate uh, parallel path here, we've got storage, again, provision a transcoding environment, and then ultimately connect all these systems um, to transcoding, I mean to storage. So let's have a look here. Let's save that. So once this is saved, um, we're ready to rock basically. Um, and uh, one key feature that I use quite a lot is notification. So we're going to be notifi notifying my Slack channel here. The reason why Slack is pretty cool to do it, I mean obviously you can use other platforms um, like Mattermost, etc. But I use Slack and this is important because it actually allows for collaboration. So if you have a team um, all logged in, you, you know they can all get notified about changes and you know, see what happens, etc. Another thing that I've added into my Slack is I've actually created a little bot. Um, so I've got my little bot as a mafia. And um, the key thing with this this bot effectively is um, I'm just going to use it for some kind of status notifications, um, you know, to check systems before we roll out or anything like that. You can dive deeper into this. This bot effectively uses an event trigger and then it goes and you know triggers underlying playbooks with ansible engine so in this case i'm only using it for status updates but you could use it to trigger apis back into tower if you wanted to or you could use it to uh, trigger individual playbooks from from engine so for this case because i want to kind of keep the uh, role-based access pretty secure uh, there might be some networking involved here later on and i certainly don't want um, people inside my Slack channel to be asking the bot to, you know, to process any type of, um, you know, plays or anything like that. So that's why I just use it for some kind of notification. Let's just have a look if he's actually there and he's awake. There we go. So he is awake. So what I'm going to do now um, is I'm actually going to just ask him to check the status to make sure that I've got all my storage nodes up. So he's going to go and just do a very simple check. And then you should reply and tell me, hey, okay, we've got all your nodes up or perhaps one node is down. And then obviously I would be able to look at that further if I wanted to. Um, so let's see what he has to say. Cool. So he's uh, come back to me. He's told me that I got four and they're all alive and up and running. So that's cool. That's a good place to be. So talking about storage, let's have a look at my Gluster nodes. Um, so I just want to have a look so we can have a look at what we got from the volume list. So currently we're only running one volume, which is a repro volume. This is a volume that I keep source material on. So effectively my source files would be sitting here, but we do want a new volume, a new volume with uh, some kind of replication. And this is where, you know, our transcoders and our uh, play out machines or streaming machines will, will interact. So we'll come back to that. Now, if we look at our workflow, uh, we looked at the workflow visualizer, we've set up our logic, 
uh, there's another thing called a survey which we want to have a look at. So if I pull up the surveys, so again I've already pre-filled most of the servers and all the all that the server basically does is it allows us to create a um, user input field which we can then take that information and we can push it into underlying variables. So the, the variables that we're going to be using in our plays um, we can actually feed them information through a survey which is which is quite powerful. This is basically what I have for this specific uh, workflow in terms of criteria. Now once we launch this job we should be asked for it and now we can configure it. So uh, the first machine that it's specifying is a dev machine so I'm just going to call it dev01. Um, I will specify my own root password. Um, I'm quite happy with two CPUs and four gigs of memory. I would like to increase my disk space and then the base image. So I've got a testing base image, I've got different flavors, but ultimately the base ISO that I have here is the one that we want to use. This is our enterprise production ready rail in, uh, deployment. Um, now we're going to specify an IP address. I'm going to stick to 10. Now the next two fields are about the transcoder sp specifically. So um, I'm going to have this default value which is in here. Obviously this can change so I'll just stick to this which is trans01 and then again IP address the default value has been set to 12 which is fine. Um, I'm quite happy to uh, continue calling my volume silo and then obviously when it comes to replication count uh, we're going to stick with 2 which is also just a default value. So from there we can trigger that and now as you can see it creates uh, a list of variables um, which are basi basically extra variables which go into this whole uh, set of plays and um, these play these uh, variables will be addressed for different playbooks um, and you know we'll pull that information through so let's launch that so now we've launched it you'll see that i got my notification on on slack saying that we are actually starting the workflow we in which part of the workflow we're on so we can have a look here and you can see we're already on this uh, component so right now it's busy building the base servers so if we go further into that specific uh, play you can see where it's it's uh, started to get what it needs to do so it's obviously going to check for um, uh, we, you know, I've got different checks in these players, checking for pre-existing um, disk images. It's going to go and try to resize those disk images based on what we want. And then ultimately change the, the root passwords. And then go through the next play and the next play and the next play. So if we have a look where we're going at the moment, it's still currently busy pushing our base image, which is fine. We'll just wait for that. Okay, so the base image has gone through, it's uh, been resized, um, and now we are busy changing the root password, and then we'll un uninstall cloud in it. Um, and then we're pretty much done on the provisioning side of it, and then it's going to move over to the next play. So now we're just creating the XMLs for, for KVM. So if we go back to the workflow, we'll see that that should finish and then it will branch off into our next two segments. So now we have our two segments which are kicking in. The one is to uh, provision the storage on our Gluster backend um, and then the other one is obviously to provision the network. So from the networking side of it we're going to be using a Jinja template. So effectively we will run through a Jinja template, take the variables that we have, um, create the config based on the template and then ultimately copy it across with uh, the KVM toolset. So that's busy with that. And then likewise on Gluster, it's going to basically rebuild or build a new volume um, on the existing bricks that are available. <clears throat> and it will use four nodes and it will obviously use these, uh, the replication of two by two to get the, um, the replication that we wanted. So those are busy. And again, as you can see, our uh, updates are constant from, from the Slack. Now you can actually disable the updates if you want, or you can specify um, only certain types of updates. So perhaps you just want failure updates, or failure notifications or something like that. You can specify that in Tower, um, but we've just got all of them on, you know, the, the more information, the better. So that's busy. 
Let's have a look again at the network to see how far it is. So as you can see, we've taken the information. We are then using the Jinja template to create it. And then ultimately we now copied that file across into the Vesicle VM. You can see that's been successful. So let's have a look at the rest of the workflow. I see storage has also been successful. So now we move into the next segment. So the, now we have a secondary build. The secondary build is the transcoder. So that transcoder is being built. Um, and like I said beforehand, these base images are fairly similar, except the transcoder has you know, additional technology, streaming tech. It's got uh, the FFmpeg for processing the video, and it's got um, a bunch of iNotify scripts for um, <clears throat> file system watches. So we, the whole point of that, obviously, is we want to try to automate the process after this in terms of dropping videos. So as we take video and we put it into the environment, um, you know, we can then trigger processing for that video. So that's busy deploying. And then the last script from the, um, the last player from the developer server itself is basically um, making sure the VM <coughs> is good and then bringing it back up. It will check, it will update it, it will do all of these other tasks that we all, you know, typically we would have done manually. Then it will export that config and uh, bring that config up um, in in KVM. So effectively, once that step is done, we should see a machine in KVM up and running called Dev01. Um, so let me just get my KVM so long. There we go there. So as you can see, there is one already. It's up and running. So to, on this play, I normally have about 100 um, seconds uh, before it completes it. So once the server is up, it will wait um, before it completes that step. Um, so the building process from the transcoder is still going on. That's probably just take a little bit while, a little while longer. Um, and then it will also move to a similar path in terms of configuring and verifying and updating. And then lastly, we will do a global mount across both nodes so that both nodes have access to the same uh, cluster environment or the same cluster volume. So that server has been complete. And now if we just have a look at how our transcode is doing. Okay, our transcode is nearly done. Um, that should be done fairly, sh yeah, there we go. We're setting the root passwords there. So yeah, that, that should also pretty much be done soon. We can have a look at our updates from Slack. And then from there, it's just gonna be a bunch of configuring. So at this point, um, once this is done, we'll go and we'll actually check uh, that the Gloucester volume is up. So we can actually do that already. So if we go into Gloucester volume list, we should see two volumes. So we have, there we go, repo and silo. So that's fine. And then uh, we'll want to obviously check the physical mounts on these machines when they're up. Um, and then obviously just make sure that uh, data is coming through. So the next step from that would be, okay, well, we now have the environment up and running and that's great. So what do we need to do? And this is where we will look at, um, you know, using webhooks and we'll simulate kind of a developer environment where, um, you know, the developer will go to their GitHub or the GitLab. Uh, they will make changes uh, to their source and they'll commit it. And then as soon as we commit, what will happen is we will try to pull that webhook in, we'll pull it into Tower, and then from there we'll automate the process um, of deploying that application. So that application will then be deployed um, onto these servers. And then, you know, the last thing that we'll do is we'll actually connect from a client. So I do have a Windows virtual machine, which I'll start up, which is on an isolated network and we'll try access um, that video server and we'll try stream some video. So let's see, let's see if we've been successful. So the transcoder provisioning is done. So now the last step is we're actually gonna go and configure, um, or we're gonna connect our cluster volumes. So cluster will then be mounted um, on all of these servers so that we can obviously have a central storage. There we go. So that's been complete. So this whole workflow um, in a matter of minutes has basically configured a storage environment. It's configured and installed um, two virtual machines. 
and it's now gone and um, updated both of those. Uh, it's installed any type of uh, specialized packages they need and um, at the end of the day it's, it's configured the file system tables and mounted the volumes um, on these servers. So now we need to do, all we need to do now is we need to actually verify um, that we have these mounts. So if I just pull up another terminal, so if I get out of there, I should be able to log into devil01. Oopsie. Okay, use the root password that we set. And there we go. So I'm on the guy, if I have a look at the mounts, um, it might actually be easier if we just do cat etc. So you can see the uh, etc configuration for the file system table. We've got both uh, the silo and the repo defined. So if we're going to um, repo like i said is normally in my repository for video so you see i've got three videos in there so that was a pre-existing volume um, now if we go into silo we shouldn't have anything yet because um, it'll take a bit of time for that to actually kick in and process okay so we can see that silo is empty so that's that's fine that's actually what we wanted to see um, okay so the next step is we're going to simulate a developer workflow by using uh, webhooks. So these webhooks, um, effectively, we're going to we're going to push it from uh, from Git. So let me just minimize this guy here. <clears throat> so as you can see, we've got all the notifications of uh, the process, which is great. Um, now, if we go, I've got a Git uh, local Git lab a server running and I've got my um, I got my go video project here so how this is going to work effectively is I just need to go make a change and commit that change that will generate the webhook and that will send the webhook through to our tower now based on that our tower will go and trigger a, um, a uh, basically an update um, and deploy a number of um, you know uh, run a basic uh, playbook where we would be um, installing things like Go, we'll be installing Go, we'll be updating, um, you know, installing Python, etc., and updating all of that. We will also then um, create the the directories that we need. Um, we'll also install Git, and then we'll uh, pull down the, the the code and the source from from Git itself. So, <clears throat> if we go back to our terminal. Um, so if I go here, so if I'm going to go in SSH back to our dev box. So if I go here, now this is where we normally install our application. You can see it's empty at the moment. So once we trigger the, the webhook, um, so I'm going to go here, this is my project. I'm just going to go edit the readme, which is probably the easiest thing to do. Um, and then we're going to edit it and then we'll generate this um, basically this push from our commit so we're just going to commit it to our master branch and again we should get an update from slack there we go so um, now slack has picked up that there's been a trigger from our side now the key thing about this is, so we're logged in here, but we logged in as an infrastructure user. Um, so if we go here, we won't be able to see any of these jobs that are currently running because I'm the infrastructure user, I'm not a development user, or I'm not an admin, I haven't allocated these uh, plays for, for the visibility of infrastructure. But as being someone on infrastructure and being in our slack channel at least we'll be able to get the job updates here in terms of you know a job has been run and then once it's been successful which is what we're really looking out for so right now um, all that's actually happening on our development server here is it's busy installing um, you know the things that we need for go etc we'll just make this a bit smaller so we can keep an eye on the slack um, in the meantime let's just have a look at our mounts 
Okay, so that's there. And let's see if uh, the transcoding stuff has happened yet. Okay, so the files are there. So our output has already been processed, um, which is great. Um, and now we're, we're just waiting for our application to be installed effectively. So there we go. Uh, we've now got an indication that this has been successful. So effectively the source code has been pushed. Now if we go back to our development box, we, er we looked earlier at our directory and we didn't have anything. So if we look now, we've got our project. So this is the source code from Git. You can see that we've also changed permissions already. So we'll have video web there, which has been um, turned into an executable for us. Um, so yeah, the, the next thing for us will be obviously to test to make sure that we can see something or we can actually get some, some video going on. So what I'll need to do is I'll need to just start up my uh, virtual machine, my Windows virtual machine. I thought I would, you know, use Windows for something. So we're going to be using um, just a standard Windows 10 client. And um, this guy will will basically connect and will be uh, using them. The, the key thing to, to note here is that this is going to be an isolated network. So this actually has, um, it's an isolated uh, network segment, which is talking to a firewall. If you look at my uh, virtual machines, you'll see I'll have a 40 gate there. This is our virtual firewall. And this is in between both networks. So we're going to see if we can... Uh, get that application going. So I'm actually just going to run that. Okay, so that application is running on that server. And now we just need to actually test it. Okay, so this guy's back up. Just had to wait for it to boot up. And let's log in here. So well, that's doing that. So if you have a look here, we've got a uh, 40 gate firewall. You can see our IP range. This is the range that we've always been on. So if we go and we log into here, so we don't have virtual interfaces or anything like that. Um, and what we really want to look at is our networking policies because that's what's going to allow traffic in and out. Um, so firewall policies. Okay, so as you can see, there's nothing. It's just an implicit deny. Okay, so let's go back to here. So um, our little Windows machine here. Um, we're going to open up the browser. Uh, external IP of the firewall. Uh, 0.0.0.241 and we're on a special port for this application so as you can see there's not much happening um, so clearly there's a problem and this is a, you know something else that we can use Ansible with and that is on the network automation so if we go here we're going to log out of our infrastructure user and let's log into our networking user. So again, then this is role-based. So you will see that, um, for example, our um, our uh, templates are, are fairly uh, limited from a uh, from a networking perspective. This is the one that we want, which is our um, virtual IP or, or virtual server, as well as a policy configuration playbook. Now the interesting thing with this is obviously with networking devices we don't work the same way as we would you know when we're talking to to servers etc. Most of it all gets processed um, on the control node itself and then those requests or those changes get uh, sent through to to the device the networking device. Now um, one cool feature about the automation platform is that we have access to things like automation hub and collections. So we get vendor-based as well as, you know, tried and tested collections of uh, plays and modules. And we're able to pull those into our uh, towers, um, just like you would with Galaxy. We are basically able to point our Galaxy to Red Hat and pull um, those resources. So if we look here, this is, for example, the uh, Fortinet collection, which I'm using. This is using um, 
the HTTP API. And uh, basically we configure everything and then this will work through that API and send the commands through the firewall. So again, if we look at the firewall, there's nothing there. Um, now, if we look from our side, okay, we're gonna want to change this. We wanna execute it. Okay, so we're gonna have a, a use another survey here effectively, and we're gonna launch, and we're gonna decide, okay, we're gonna NAT effectively for port two internally, all source addresses, and uh, this will be called dev net. Um, I'm going to give this a policy of, uh, let's say, 48, for example. It's a policy ID number. And what is the name here? We're just going to call it netdev01. Cool. Now let's trigger that. And that's busy running. So ultimately, at the end of this, we should have virtual IP as well as a... Um, policy in place and then we can test uh, the Windows machine again to see if we can actually get to our little video server and ultimately stream off everything. Okay, so this warning is just uh, I haven't updated the um, Ansible module. Um, okay, and we've it's gone through so it's successful. So if we go back to the firewall, you see that wasn't uh, there wasn't a policy before and if we refresh it, uh, ref refresh it, we should effectively see a new policy. There we go. So this is our policy um, for a virtual IP going to DevNet. Um, it's got NAT enabled, etc. Obviously, we can add in security profiles if we wanted to, but that's all we really were looking for. Um, okay, so now let's go back to this guy. So if we trigger this refresh, oh, there we go. We're already uh, talking to something, just a certificate issue. Okay, and there we go. Welcome to Ansible Flix. So if I wanted to watch a video, um, I can look at my current, not many options obviously, but uh, let's have a look at uh, something. You can watch this guy here. And there we go. We have now got a video streaming service built by Ansible. Um, and yeah, that's what we want to see. Uh, if we have a look here, let's go through to another video perhaps so watch out Netflix Ansible's on its way cool well that uh, concludes this uh, session uh, I hope it was insightful and um, thank you for joining me